Welcome to the 1847 show. I'm your host, Prince Larmin Jarbo. And on this show, we highlight the ingenuity of Liberians in and out of Liberia by sharing their successes, challenges, entrepreneur endeavors, and much more with the intent to inspire upcoming change makers. And this is season one, episode two, which is part of our series called Social Entrepreneurs. This series highlights the efforts of change makers who have found innovative solutions to solving social problems that affect our nation. Our guest today is Mr. Leo E. Tia, who is the executive director of the Youth Network for Positive Change, or UNETPO. Mr. Tia is best known for his enduring efforts to promote youth empowerment across Liberia. The first question I have for you here is, your organization has been around since 2014 and completed over 20 projects. You know, what would you say led to this success? I'm so, I'm so excited and first of all, and, uh, and to be on this platform. And um, your Nepal success uh, is based in a screen of a team a team of young people that are motivated to a cause that has to do with uh, creating positive impacts in communities to help young people realize their full potential. So all of what we have achieved, um, it is the basic effort of all of the young people that work in your network. You've been in operation since 2014. and. One thing I know for sure is that with any journey, there come challenges. So what challenges has your team encountered and what specific leadership traits did you have to utilize to lead your team in those difficult times? Thank you. Um, challenges are so many and they will always exist. Some of the challenges that we have had over the past time is that from the inception stages, we had a challenge of securing an office space. You know, for a non-for-profit organization like ours and like any other non-for-profit organization, you have to have a presence that people can walk up to your office, that partners can reach out to you to engage. It was a challenge from the beginning. The next thing that was a major challenge is the issue of resource mobilization. Resource mobilization has been a challenge from the beginning and even today it's still a challenge, but at a different level. So the two key challenges was very, 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 you know, um, enemy to our progress. What we did to overcome our challenges is just simple. We worked together as a team to make sure that no matter what it costs us, no matter what it takes, we will try to maintain what we call an office space. Even if it will cost us to go out of our comfort zone, to go within our personal covers, to raise money on our own to rent an office space, we saw it to be the best option at the time. When it comes to resource mobilization, we decided to take off our sleeves. Whether you are an executive director, whether you are a program manager, no matter what, whether you are a board member, we all decided to raise funding for your neighborhood to ensure that if we are going outside to raise money from people, we should first be a contributor to our own cause. How was your organization able to accomplish such a milestone to have people being paid as a nonprofit where you're not expecting any income on a regular basis? Well, um, like I always say, I think, uh, as uh, you know, take me for this on this platform. I think I have, uh, I have the best staff in the world. I would say the best staff in the world because uh, all of those that today call staff, they were volunteers, you know, back then where they were 100% volunteer. Without any volunteer how to run them, they were just volunteering their services for free. But today, you know, we can have people that are on payroll. And right now, we only have one volunteer within our organization. And our staff capacity right now is, is at 28. We drop a bit due to donor concern and demand. So we were at 32, and then we are currently at 28. But then to answer your question straight forward is that... Um, what has helped us is that we decided not to quit on our resource mobilization. And our strategies include so many. One of our strategies that have been able to succeed is that we always write when we have or when we see a call for proposal or call for application that has to do with grant. We don't relent. Even if it would take us to write 100 proposals in a month, our team is willing to do that. But like what happens when you get a funding, uh, but it's not a reoccurring funding and you and you need a different type of uh, funds for a different project. 
how do you go back to the same grantor and say, hey, we need more money for a different project? How do you ensure that you can continue those partnerships? Okay, so one thing we do is that uh, we know that uh, every grant has a lifespan, and that lifespan may be six months, maybe one month, maybe one year. So from our experience with our donors and partners is that uh, over the time, like since 2021, we've been implementing on the HIV and AIDS program uh, called Epic Project, supported by USAID. So that grant is a one-year grant, but then it is renewable. And it should be ending in 2024. So what we've done to know that we have to do a matching now because they are our bigger donor currently. So what we have in place is that since we know that we have this grant and then they are our biggest grant and they constitute most of our staff in terms of salaries and, then, and whatsoever. So we have already started the process of securing another uh, grant for another partner. That should, in case uh, this project elapsed, this another project is available to continue what the other project started in terms of our starving. Has there been a time where um, the the timelines doesn't always work out where you're not able to you know leave one funding to another immediately that you had to there's a gap in between that you have to wait and what impact did that have on your mission? Yeah, obviously, obviously, there have been times where things don't really play out the way we want or the way we wish for it to go. So um, with that, what, we, what we've always maintained is that we have tried our best to ensure that uh, we, we, we keep engaging with the project. Take, for example, if we had this project and then the project have closed from the donor funding, we still engage with the beneficiary to ensure that if not 100%, even if it is 10% of what the project is supposed to do in terms of its uh, activities or impact, we continue with those activities to ensure that we we keep rolling things out. So that gave our donor that uh, the, uh, the our donor the the, the 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 idea that this project is now a dead project that we are about to go and wake up. It's a project that is living, but then it is moving at a slower pace. So because of that. We can come in to be able to ensure that the pace speed up and meet up with what it should be. So, but actually, there have been times where we have not had a project or we have not had a, a donor to continue for another donor. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about that internship program where you're trying to partner with other nonprofit uh, organizations to give students uh, during the vacation time the opportunity to be able to get experience or hands on job experience. Um, just go ahead and talk a little bit about that and, and what the thematic area is. So uh, basically, uh, the YEAR program, which is a youth empowerment program, is basically on our educational uh, agenda in terms of our educational thematic area. So basically, the YEAR program is, uh, is something that we decided to introduce. We've actually been piloting it for some time now. Like uh, normally what we do since 2018, we take interns to come at UNEPO from various schools, universities, colleges, and high schools to come and intern for a specific period of time at UNEPO, and then you go back to your institution. Because there is a challenge in our community that a lot of young uh, students or young people don't have uh, job experience and so it set it served as a barrier when it comes to getting a job in Liberia. The job space is already tight. The most employers ask for three to five year work experience. So with that, we've decided to introduce this program with our partners. So uh, what we what the program intend to achieve is basically to give students, especially university and high school graduates the opportunity to intern at an institution, and then they have the job on experience, at least. And then they also learn a lot of new things that can prop up to what they've already attained professionally to be able to fit into the job market. 